Welcome to Unlocked, the home of common sense that speaks Britain's language. It's now been four and a half years since 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union. Now, with just 48 days to go until we finally leave, we ask, on Friday the 13th, are we heading for a Brexit horror show? With Biden coming and Cummings going, are we being bounced into a brino? On today's Unlocked, to give you unparalleled insight, we have five former MEPs, one serving MP and a baroness. Uh, we also, well, barring a bombshell, it looks like Joe Biden will be the next president of the USA. So with us also to discuss what that means for Brexit and Britain's future, we are joined by Sir John the Don Redwood, who this week wrote an open letter to President-elect Joe Biden. Well, earlier today, I spoke with Baroness Claire Fox, who this week chastised the House of Lords for repeatedly trying to block Brexit, and today issued the stark warning that Boris is finished if he betrays Brexit. Also joining us will be the battle-ready June Mummery and Paul Lines to update us on all the key fishing news, and the formidable June Slater will give us the grassroots reaction. But first of all, to reflect on an action-packed week that has seen the dramatic resignation of Number 10's Director of Communications, Lee Kane, and Boris Johnson's Chief Advisor, Dominic Cummings, let's go to Ben Habib, former MEP. So, Ben, what is your reaction to Cummings going? And is this the beginning of a sellout on Brexit? It's been an extraordinary 10 days for Brexit. You know, we've had Trump um, arguably defeat, I say arguably because we've got a judicial review, but arguably defeated in the American elections. We've had the internal market bill, which was meant to undo parts of the Northern Irish Protocol, defeated in the House of Lords. Um, we've had complete silence from David Frost, even though he's had a week of engagement with Michel Barnier. Michel Barnier, by the way, apparently is on holiday at the moment. Um, and, um, and now today we hear that Cummings has gone. So you know, it couldn't really be have been a worse week for Brexit. And, you know, just to, just to remind viewers, about a month ago was meant to be the deadline that we would declare to leave without a deal if we didn't have any significant movement in talks with the EU. And here we are a month later, there's been no significant movement. We've seen the geopolitical landscape move against Brexit and things frankly aren't looking all that good. Yeah, I have to say, Ben, I'd just like to give all, all of the guests today and the viewers a bit of feedback. Um, the WhatsApp groups of the Brexiteers on the ground, you know, the, the, the boots on the ground that knocked on the doors and really got Brexit done. That there is a feeling um, of morosity, um, a lack of confidence today. I'm hoping that Sir John Redwood shortly can put us right on that. But I also asked a few of our former MEP colleagues for their take on events. And I got a few messages to read out here to all of you. Anne Widdicombe got back and said Boris has had more extensions than Theresa May and will betray Brexit under the cover of Covid. Chief Whip Brian Monteith said it's now looking like a choice between a poor deal and a no deal with my money on the former, not very optimistic there. Christina Jordan warned Brexiteers know how to regroup and do it quickly. Don't insert expletive here, <laughs> test their patience and finally John Tennant up north. People are quickly losing faith in Boris's get Brexit done slogan. So Ben, what do you make of all that? There's quite a lot of negativity out there. How do we keep the faith and just keep pushing for Brexit? Well, the reality is that this hasn't been a year of getting Brexit done. This actually has been a year of Boris, of us hoping that Boris will save us from the withdrawal agreement that he signed us into. This has been a year really of trying to rescue Brexit. And we've all put our faith in Boris. He was elected with his tremendous majority to get it done. We've all been hoping against hope that he's got some clever plan up his sleeve. But the reality is, if he really wanted to get a proper Brexit, he wouldn't have signed a withdrawal agreement that breaches his con uh, con Conservative Party manifesto pledges within a month of having taken office of prime minister. And I'm just gonna read, I'm just gonna read a paragraph from the Conservative Party manifesto. It states, Boris Johnson's new deal takes the whole country out of the EU 
as one united kingdom. It takes us out of the customs union, allowing us to set our own tariffs and do our own trade deals. It allows us to pass our own laws and it ensures that it's our courts that enforce them. Well, we know now from Boris himself that actually his deal doesn't do that. He's had to go back to the Commons and try and get this internal market bill through to make sure that Northern Ireland isn't annexed by the European Union. And that's been defeated. But more importantly, and this is a really crucial point, even though the internal market bill seeks to bring Northern Ireland back in to the United Kingdom, it offers up no solution for the Irish border. If you neuter the border in the Irish Sea, you still need to put a customs border somewhere. So what we now have is Boris Johnson in all sorts of trouble. He's caught between a rock and a hard place of his own making, where six weeks or less away from the end of the year, no deal in sight, and I have lost confidence completely in this government's ability to give effect to a proper Brexit. We are gonna get one of two things. We're gonna get Brino, which he will no doubt champion as a fantastic deal, or we're going to get something that not a lot of commentators have focused on and potentially an extension in the transition period. But do you not think, Ben, that the Tories are under such pressure to stick to their manifesto come the next election, if they betray their pledges, especially the ones they've made in their manifesto that got the majority, surely that's game over for the Tory party. Are you sure they're going to be so blatantly, um, you know, opposing everything in their manifesto, like you suggest? I, I think they've I think they've run out of options. Um, they're clearly not prepared to do no deal. As I said right from the beginning, if you want a good deal, and indeed as Theresa May and Boris Johnson have both said, if you want a good deal, you've got to be prepared to leave without one. And they have, Theresa May before him and Boris Johnson have repeatedly cried wolf with the no deal threat, and they've repeatedly failed to take action in that regard. Michael Gove is in charge of no deal planning. Michael Gove is famously against a no deal outcome. He said repeatedly, he's on the record saying that no deal is a bad deal. So you can't trust where this government is going and it's too late, I think, for them to pivot and now give effect to a proper no deal outcome with the benefits of the United Kingdom held first and foremost. We are heading towards Brino or we're heading towards an extension of the transition period. The prime minister has failed us on Brexit and yes, Belinda, it is gonna be game over at the next election as far as I can see. Well, before we put that to Sir John Redwood, th those are big things to say. There's an extra reason that we have to get something done, because look who's back. I know it's Friday the 13th, but it's a horror show. Lord Adonis has resurfaced. <laughs> that guy who we thought we'd flushed down the toilet of politics, he's back, saying the Brexit revolution has just devoured its evil geniuses. Of course, I'm assuming he's referring to Cummings. Mr. Cummings. <laughs> and he's saying here, it's my view that when we rejoin the European Union, we will also join the Euro. Sir John, we're coming to you shortly. This must be stopped. The nightmare. Back to you, Ben. You've got a question about what Rishi Sunak said this week, Belinda. Yes, just regarding your article in The Express, Ben, um, you wrote that Rishi Sunak talks, of course, about regulatory <laughs> alignment in the city. Um, you said this was a disaster, Ben. You said this was a surrender. Can you explain to our viewers what you mean? Well, one of the huge benefits that the European Union currently has is access to the city. They need us a hell of a lot more than we need them. And what Rishi Sunak did on Monday was to unilaterally declare that the city would welcome all EU firms, irrespective of the outcome of Brexit. And in making that unilateral declaration, he effectively gave up one of the best trumps that we had in our hand of cards. And this comes back again, Belinda, to my conclusion that there is no way this government is committed to a proper Brexit, because if it had been committed to that Brexit, it would have held that trump card until a much later date. In fact, it would never have given that trump card up. Um, you know, I just hold my head in my hands and just wonder what the hell they're up to. Well, I think they're probably using distraction and exhaustion over Brexit to, to perhaps sneak a few things through. I hope I'm proved wrong. Mm. OK, so, Ben, I'm going to ask you the final question of today, although please do stick around. And I'm going to ask this question to all of today's guests and also out there. If you want to get involved with your comments on Facebook, punch some comments in. They're going to be fed to us live during the broadcast. We want to read out the best comments that we get. And it's this question. And I know, Ben, I've asked you many times over the previous year. 
I want to try and gauge your optimism in marks out of 10. What's your Brexometer score this week with 10 being a delicious, clean break from the European Union and zero being total surrender? What's the scores on the doors this week, Ben Habib? On the 15th of October, when Boris said that if unless the EU makes significant concessions, we're getting WTO, I gave him a six. Quite a low mark because I didn't trust him. A month later, I think I'm being proven right. As I said, I believe we're heading for Brino or an ex extension of the transition period. He's down at one out of 10, as far as I'm concerned. Wow. Well, well that is, that's a pessimistic score. I think that's the worst score we've ever had. Yeah, yeah, right. Ben, we're going to park you to one side now because I need to have a little think about that myself. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic. You, know, you and I voted for Boris's withdrawal agreement as MEPs. We place our faith in the Prime Minister yeah. to get this job done. And I still, I, I'm glass half full. I, I have to be. I have to be glass half full. What about yourself? Well, do you not think that Boris actually, if he had all his MEPs behind him, the real force fueling and driving him forward as the real backbone against the EU's unreasonable demands, he would be in a better place? It just makes me wonder, what obstacles is he facing, perhaps in his own party, that's making him retreat on the pledges because surely it's it's in the total advantage for the conservatives to stick to their manifesto as ben said come next election who's going to trust what manifesto they put to the people again well belinda that's an excellent segue into our next guest sir john redwood mp for Wokingham, joins us um, a legendary brexiteer who's never once bowed away from the line since the very very beginning and a friend of Unlock, Sir John. It's a tremendous pleasure once again to have you on the show. Um, we're hoping you can lift the mood because uh, Ben's been a bit of a Grinch <laughs> at Christmas there. Um, Sir John, please cheer us up. We want to be glass half full. So first of all, Sir John, um, any reaction to today's events, the comings, goings, and also what Ben Habib has just said? How do you believe we're on track for Brexit, Sir John? Statements that are coming out of the government, the public ones you've heard, the, the private ones I get when I query these points, as I do from time to time, uh, are entirely encouraging. I mean, the government says that they are leaving without a deal unless the EU changes its mind, scraps their demands on our fish, understands we're going to be making our own laws and understands we are going to be an independent sovereign country. I heard Mr. Goh saying exactly that very recently. So I, I find that encouraging. Uh, they seem to have understood that we Brexiteers are quite determined. We think no deal is a good outcome. We don't go around thinking it's a bad outcome. Throughout the referendum campaign, I was saying the only thing I can promise you if we win uh, is getting out with no deal. But obviously, if there was a better deal on offer than no deal, that would be great. And if the EU was sensible, there would be a better deal on offer than no deal. There would be a tariff-free trade arrangement as well as us regaining our independence. But if the EU is not sensible, if they're out to make a political point, then we must just leave without that. I have heard and seen nothing in the last few days that implies the government hasn't got that. Uh, and I stood on that manifesto. I think it was the first time for a long time I was able to stand on the manifesto without writing my own version of it on the European matter because previous <laughs> conservatives hadn't uh, taken the view that I took that we needed to leave the EU. I used to campaign for a referendum when my party didn't want one. We then got the party to want a referendum. And then when Mrs May was our leader, I always made clear that I thought the no deal option was probably the best we were going to do and we should be, should be proud of that. So I, I think we need to keep up the pressure because you can never be sure, of course, I can't make you promises. It's what the government does. But I can tell you this, you're only going to have this government leading us through this process. It's recently elected. It's got a big majority. It said the right things in the manifesto. Uh, so those who are optimistic, just wait for the ride to complete. Those of you who are very nervous or think you're going to be let down, lobby your MPs, write to the government, send a letter into Mr. Go, tweet, get out there unlocked as you are doing to make it very clear to the government that whilst there were 17 million of us at the time of the referendum. There are millions and millions of us now who want this over with. And we've got some people who didn't vote for Brexit who just say, for goodness sake, give it a chance. It was the will of the people. Mm. And I'm yes. full of optimism for Brexit. Mm. I want the freedoms. 
And I want out of that single market because it's wrecked our fishing industry, damaged our farming industry, and given us a massive balance of payments deficit. Now, why should we offer them anything for our balance of payments deficit? They should be bidding for it, not the other way around. This is exactly what we needed to hear, John, exactly what we needed to hear, because you can't blame people in a way for feeling rather nervous about what's going on and everything you read in the papers with all the posturing, just because we've been burnt for the past four years with feeling like we were conned out of what we voted for by various politicians, Labour and Tory. So that's that's fantastic. I wanted to to ask you because... before that. Oh, yeah. So John, we're back in the room. Positivity is back in the room. <laughs> Thank you for that, mate. We did after, it. After Ben Habib, I was feeling a little bit morose. <laughs> On to you, yeah, Brenda. no, I love that exactly. <laughs> that, that's why we love you on this show, John. Um, so yeah, you did tweet today, which I thought was really interesting. That the EU single market has damaged our economy crippling us with huge trade deficit whilst we have a, a surplus with the rest of the world. You know, the, you said they took our fish, they cut our food production and even pushed us into importing electricity. Time to break free and do better. Is that what the majority of Tory MPs also feel? Is that the force in, in government at the moment? Yes, a majority of Tory MPs, of course they think that. I mean, they should all think that because we all fought on the same pro-Brexit manifesto, but I can't speak for every one of them. Uh, but those crucial MPs who won seats for the first time from other parties, particularly from Labour, they feel this. They know that they got those votes because they were promising a clean, undiluted, freedom-seeking Brexit. And they don't want to be let down any more than you and I want to be let down. So again, I say, courage. We, we've not got that many more days left, and I don't think they can extend the deadline again in the way that Mrs May always used to, to our enormous frustration. Uh, they know they want this over with. And of course, there are quite a lot of government ministers who still think that there is a better deal possible than leaving without a deal. I think that's very optimistic of them. But if they want to have one, one or two more days trying to find that, I suppose I can't begrudge them that. They don't want to be blamed, I think, for breaking off the talks prematurely. I don't think there's any danger of that. I think we drag these talks on long after the time when it was crystal clear that the EU was out to harm us and wanted to walk away from the promises they'd made in their political agreement and withdrawal negotiations under Mrs May. So I say, keep up the pressure, keep up your spirits, remind your neighbours, your friends and the whole of the world that we are proud Brexiteers and we do not intend at this last stage to be cheated of those freedoms. We believe in our country. We think it's been held back and it's high time we got on with it. Yeah, superb, John. Um, we've got loads and loads of comments coming in um, from Facebook. I'm going to read some of those out at the end. I know you're a busy guy. You've got to go away. While we've got you here, I'd like to move on to the next point, if I could. If anybody watching who hasn't checked out uh, the John Redwood Diary.com, it's an excellent page where John pumps his thoughts out straight to the public. And people have been commenting, John, on an article you wrote earlier this week, an open letter you wrote to Joe Biden. Now, of course, there's a lot of talk, obviously, about Biden and what it means for Brexit. First of all, do you think Biden is bad for Brexit? A lot of people have been saying that. And secondly, tell us a bit more about what was in your open letter to President-elect Joe Biden. Yeah, I put out a draft open letter. I'm going to send it as and when he becomes the President-elect, because of course they are going through certain legal processes and recounts, uh, and we need to await, I think, the formal declaration. But it looks pretty likely. He seems to have secured a, a big majority of the popular vote and he seems to have got the electoral college votes. Well, what I said to, to Mr. Biden is that, of course, the UK will have many common interests with a United States under Democrat control and that we will work together as we always have on NATO and common defense and international peace and, and international trade. Uh, there are a whole variety of things which make us natural allies. That was made very clear because, of course, Mr. Biden uh, rang our Prime Minister number two after Canada and before the uh, main European continentals and made it very clear that was his view. So that part of my letter isn't needed. That's already happened that our Prime Minister, far more important, has been in direct contact with the uh, potential president-elect and there is all that guarantee. But we need to be realistic. Um, Mr Biden has made very clear that he, he has um, a, a lot of sympathy for the Republic of Ireland because he has Irish roots and Irish connections. And obviously the Republic of Ireland is the main leader of the European Union's uh, difficulties uh, over our withdrawal. And they still think that they can 
create we can't do that which is to be part of the united kingdom it's going to be fully part of our single market and of course there will be an electronic border between our single market and the european single market now i don't buy into this line that because there could be tariffs there therefore has to be a physical border on the island of ireland i don't see that at all what people seem to forget is this is this is already a very important international border there are different excise rates on our side from their side. There, there are different VAT rates on our side from their side. There's different currency. So when goods move across that border, there have to be all kinds of exchanges of information and then electronic changes. They don't happen at the border. You don't have the truck driver stopping at the border and getting out a wadge of 20 pound notes to settle the excise bill or the VAT bill. It all happens away from the border electronically, but be in no doubt, it is an important VAT excise and financial border. If we need tariffs as well, they'll be handled in exactly the same way as excise and VAT. They won't be paying fibers at the border. And of course, because of COVID, there have already been some obstacles recently on the border and nobody's paid any heed to that at all. So there is a sort of political, I think, motivation for making the border so important in these discussions that, that can't be forgotten. Yeah, but well, there's a fundamental it's... dishonesty as well. Yeah. That the truth is that the European Union wants elements of a physical border to protect their single market, and that would be on their side. Now, we can't stop them doing that. We'd rather they didn't do it. But the, the fire of Mr. Biden and others who, who seem to think we might be wanting a, a firm border should, of course, be directed to the European Union. Because exactly. they're the ones that say mm. their single market is so precious that it needs strong borders and they need an external border for other reasons. We don't because, of course, we're keeping on with the common travel area with, with the Republic of Ireland. So we don't need physical controls on people at the border either because we handle it through the common travel area. Yeah, and isn't it interesting as well how both um, Joe Biden and Speaker Nancy Pelosi both weaponized the Good Friday Agreement during the run-up to the presidential election. And you state in, in, in your piece this week that the UK has no intention of going against that at all. No, of course not. We are upholders of it, uh, as is the Republic and, and as are uh, the Americans who were very helpful in creating it in the first place. And that is all respected. So this is politics. This isn't uh, true government. So no, we're not going to damage the Good Friday Agreement. We don't see the need for huge new physical barriers, uh, but we can live with tariffs if we need to live with tariffs. And one of the paradoxes, shall we put it mildly, about the European Union is that they say um, tariffs would be the end of the world for their trade with us, because of course they sell us a lot more than we sell them, so that there would be tariffs on their goods. And yet they insist on tariffs for our trade with the rest of the world. Uh, so they obviously think they're a good thing if they're dealing uh, outside Europe, uh, but they are never asked to reveal why they hold this very muddled view by the interviewers, because all the interviewers on the conventional media are always bashing Britain and never bashing the EU. Exactly. So thank heavens, there's a bit of balance in some places, like unlocked. Welcome, welcome to EU logic. <laughs> anyway, Martin. Yeah, so, so yeah. Um, another thing that you spoke about um, on, a, on a tweet on Tuesday, and this is coming on to our next guest, Baroness Fox. And I thought this was brilliant. Why does the House of Lords always take the EU line and why do they want to be governed by Brussels? What's all I that know. about? And, and this, this absurd argument that these clever people in the House of Lords were, were putting forward that we're going to be breaking international law. No, we're not. <laughs> they should look at the law they helped us pass. The only reason I could bring myself to vote for the Withdrawal Agreement Act was because... Bill Cash, with my support and others, proposed a sovereignty clause, which was central to the whole proposition. And because the sovereignty clause is in the EU Withdrawal Act, we've only consented to the withdrawal agreement to the extent that it doesn't damage British sovereignty. So we're not breaking the law at all. We now need to clarify and improve the British law under our sovereignty clause. And I want to get on with that. And the House of Lords dared to vote it down after that huge mandate that the British people gave to be independent and to have laws made in Parliament rather than in Brussels. They are quite wrong on this. And they are going to find more and more people saying, who are you? Why are you doing this? You are standing against the sacred will of the British people in both the referendum and the general election. And you are against the law you helped pass, which to my delight had as a central feature of it, 
that in future we make our own laws, whatever the EU might say. Bring yeah. it on, get, get <laughs> on with it. I love it, absolutely. Well, the House of Lords have not done themselves any favours the past four years, constantly trying to derail a democratic, not just one democratic vote, but yeah. I think we've voted four times for Brexit. Yeah. But John, I wanted to ask you, in, in these sort of uncertain, worrying times for Brexiteers, where again, we don't know what to believe, we don't know whether to get our hopes up or not, do you have a message for all our viewers, all the Brexiteers and Democrats out there? Yes, carry on. Believe in the faith and tell all those who don't that they're wrong and that they must go along with the will of the majority and the will of the British people. As you say, we've been asked many times now, do we still want this? I want it even more. I'm even more frustrated at the delays, the dilution, the attempted unwinding of this vote of the British people. And I'm thrilled that the British people still want to get on with this. And so you can help us. All of you watching can help us make sure people know you want this and you're going to have it. Yes, yeah, John. So let's, just, let's be see, part uh, of the next resilient generation. The Queen often talks about her resilient generation who went through quite clearly far worse. But we do need to keep the faith and not be mm -hmm. battered and distracted and exhausted to just let it all go. So I'm so glad to have you on the show to have that energy and positivity. John, John, I've got one final question. Just want to add that during your effusive message then I think I saw Paul Lyons take a tug from his hip flask on his boat in Great Yarmouth. So you certainly get the spirit of the nation rising, John. I'm asking everybody today before I read out some messages from Facebook because they're pouring in. John, you're getting people excited out there. John, scores on the doors with 10 being a beautiful, clean Brexit and zero being complete capitulation to Brussels. Where are we today, Sir John? I'm not a commentator in this. Uh, I'm one of the partisans, so I don't give you a commentator's score. I want a 10. I want to be there and deliver the whole thing. I want it clean, pure, freedom loving. And when we look out at our great ports and see how few fishing vessels there are left, as you're going to see shortly, I think, it is a disgrace. And those ports that were once filled with fishing vessels, landing fish in Britain that we could eat or could add to our processing industries have been taken away from us and given elsewhere. The sooner we get them back, the better. So John Redwood, as ever, an absolute pleasure and never a chore. You've certainly raised our spirits, certainly with Paul Lyons. I think he just got a couple down him. Thank you very much for coming on Unlock today. You've been a great friend of the show and please come back on for much, much more. Thank you for your time, Thank you, John. Sir John. And viewers out there, if you want to get involved, please share with your friends, tell them about Unlocked. Follow us on Facebook at Unlocked United Kingdom, on Twitter at Unlocked underscore UK underscore. Send us your questions. An absolute shed load of comments have come in. Belinda's going to read a few out now, if I could, before we go to our interview with Claire Fox. Pete Sonics, wouldn't it be great to be full of confidence in our government? Nurse, I think, I think he's taking <laughs> the mickey there. The next comment is from Richard Beardwell. I voted for Boris as little good opposition available, and I am bitterly disappointed. Doesn't quite share Sir John's optimism, but not quite as pessimistic as Ben Habib. Next comment from Jane Marie Smith. I voted for Boris to get the job done. I'm afraid he's not going to do it. My trust in him has now gone. Not quite so good. And one final one, and this is one I like, from Johnny Reid. The referendum was asking if we wanted to leave. We were never asked if we wanted a deal. Yeah. And isn't that a true point? John, you're nodding yeah. your head there. It's almost going to fall off. Cut back on that. Yeah, absolutely right. I voted to leave not for a deal. Um, we weren't asked for a deal. And if we'd been offered the kind of deal the EU has in mind, we'd all have said no. That is quite obvious. And I want to get behind you. Unlocked. Great. Get the message out. People support Unlocked. You support the cause. Thank you. Thank that's you very much. And, that, and that's a nice little plug there for, from Sir John at the end. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. Please that, enjoy John. your weekend. Keep up the good work, sir. Well, <laughs> that was rabble rousing. You know, but we needed it yeah. because we, we don't have that, that security anymore. Brexiteers and Democrats and everyone who just wants to get a good... If it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. If you have a fudgy, dodgy deal... Well, We'll be back to square one in a few years and there'll be another referendum trying to get us back into the EU. That's why it's so important it's done well. So, so are you keeping the faith in Boris Martin? Um, I'm always a glass half full person. And if it's not glass half full, it's time for another glass full. <laughs> uh, but my point is, is, is this. Um, I, I really enjoyed John getting furious there with the House of Lords.
because they have absolutely been a constant donkey at the gate. They've been blocking democracy ever since the start, but things have changed. Mm. They've invited in a certain Baroness Fox of Berkeley. <laughs> and wow, she was really in effusive form earlier on when I spoke to her today. She talked about Boris being um, in grave peril if he doesn't deliver. But the first thing we talked about was an amazing speech she gave on Monday. We're going to cut to that and then her interview and then back to the studio. Outside of this place and outside of the Westminster bubble, this row over part five is seen as a last ditch battle in the Brexit wars. Yet another attempt at using legalese to delay the realisation of finally being free of the EU's jurisdiction. I beg to differ with my Honourable Lord Howard because a certain type of Remain supporter, having lost at the polls, seem keen to use this House to kill the bill. I have heard Honourable Lords here state this place must block, block, block again and again and again. But whether Brexit is the reason or not, perhaps more humility is required in this House. So Baroness Fox, an absolute tub thumper of a speech on Monday. Brilliant, brilliant viewing. You're doing exactly what we wanted you to do, and that's to be a wrecking ball inside that place. Before we return to the detail of that, can I please ask you to reflect upon the dramatic announcement of Dominic Cummings leaving number 10? Seems to be chaos. What do you think this means for Brexit, Claire? So... We've got to bear in mind that we don't know what it means for Brexit because this is court politics. This is not dem dem democratic politics. There's like a court around, you know, of courtiers vying for influence over Boris Johnson. And we might well all associate uh, Dominic Cummings in a way with the kind of hardline Brexit. He was the person who was guaranteeing um, that it would happen. But it's also the case that a lot of things that appear to have been happening under Dominic Cummings have not been positive about Brexit or COVID or anything else. So I don't want to make it sound as though he's the hero and without him it'll all go away because that's not quite true. And it is interesting, don't you think, that there are people like Priti Patel and various other Brexiteers who are glad to see the back of him. So don't let's think that's the main thing that we need to see. But anything that's a clear out of the vote leave crowd from number 10 unelected officials that they are therefore anti-democratic anyway in a way that they're so influential it makes you nervous that maybe this is a softening of the brexit moment yeah i mean it certainly seems that way you'd have seen you're in this um, mep whatsapp group the brexit party and widdicom saying just now boris has had more extensions than theresa may and he will betray brexit under cover of covid claire well that's what i, I think it's more that i'm more nervous about the direction of travel in general you know not that's what i'm saying is the dominant coming saying don't let's get overly distracted I, I under the cover of covid i mean they've done quite well of not using covid up until now in some ways but i think what we have all been aware of is that there doesn't appear to be the courage to really look the eu in the eye and just say that, you know you're the ones acting in bad faith all the time and we're walking away that Everybody is so desperate to get a deal, and I, and I, I, it's not that it's not that a deal was never going to be possible or even positive, but it just feels to me as there's too much attempt to get a deal at all costs, and and that makes me nervous. The extension thing is what we need to look out for, isn't it? You know, there's this: can we delay it a little bit more? Can we just move it into the long grass further? And I'm nervous. I'm not as pessimistic as some of my fellow former MEPs, I, or, or rather, I don't think it's predetermined, but I was always nervous about these negotiations. OK, I want to ask you for your scores on the doors at the end of this interview, but before that, let's return to your speech. Now, it's fair to say, once again, Claire, you've ruffled a few feathers this week, and it was particularly beautiful to watch. Something was put into action by you on Monday that we talked about a lot beforehand, and that is the very real sense that the House of Lords was seen by the electorate and by outsiders as little more than a blocking mechanism. And you said the, this place must block, block, block again and again and again. Tell us about your speech and the impact it's had, Claire. I think the most important thing to note is throughout the discussions on the internal market bill at the House of Lords, 
I've been genuinely shocked by the number of people in the House of Lords who've said, in this instance, we're just not going to let this bill through. And the House of Lords generally acknowledge that they have a limited role. You know, they are the people who scrutinise legislation and we can have arguments about and, and would be right to have arguments about the fact that they're an unelected body of appointees even that scrutiny role is undemocratic but they kind of in a way know the limits of their power and so they will send things back to the house of commons saying things like can you revise this you should check this you should do this but in the instance of the internal market bill they've used part five which is the ele allegation that this is a breach of international law breaking the law to basically say we will do whatever it takes to stop part five going through, which basically neuters the whole of the internal markets bill. And therefore, it, we have to remember, opens up the United Kingdom as a geographic entity and as a political sovereign entity to EU interference. That's what it does, let alone, uh, you know, but through the mechanism of Northern Ireland and then disingenuously does that by saying it's all to do with the peace treaty. But in view of the fact that the DUP um, and Kate Hoey very much with the interests of Northern Ireland at heart, so this is disingenuous nonsense and that actually it's a betrayal of the Northern Irish protocol and the Northern Irish people as an entity as part of the UK to go along uh, uh, with the EU on this. Um, I think you can see it's a split uh, issue. So from my point of view, I wanted to remind them of their role and that in fact they had no right to act in that way, because that was the affront to democracy, as well as to remind them why it was that the Tories had got into this situation. Now, I, the thing that's difficult is that we know that Boris got himself into this mess because they signed that withdrawal agreement when they didn't need to, having been elected. And actually, the internal markets bill, including part five, is an attempt at staying true to the promise they made to the electorate. It is an attempt at saying we won't let the EU interfere, but they should have done that prior. <laughs> they should have done it after getting elected. They should have sorted it out then. But Boris wanted to deliver his oven ready deal as, as optics. And so when you were asking me earlier about whether Dominic Cummings going is the problem for Brexit, now I think the problem for Brexit is that we've always known that there was this problem with the withdrawal agreement presented far too positively in some ways and so they're trying to get out of it uh, this way yeah and you are absolutely no holds barred again you called the withdrawal agreement shoddy and that boris signed it warts and all but my favorite part of the speech when you said baroness buckley baroness brexit when you said more humility is required in this place and lord howard looked like he'd found a fly in his suit claire Yes, well, you've got to bear in mind that one of the things that threw me is that even though we're saying it's for or against Brexit, Howard is a Brexiteer. And there was quite a few quite hard Brexit people who went against the government on this on the basis that they said it broke international law. And what it dawned on me was that in that house, instead of being Brexiteers, they became lawyers. It was like being confronted with a house full of QCs. There was a great speech by uh, Lord Moylan, D uh, Daniel Moylan, his great uh, co you know, colleague in Tory, who basically said, I feel as though I've, been, I've woken up in a convention of lawyers. But if you, if you had this as a convention of grocers, or if you want workers from the Red Wall, they would have a different approach to it. If you only see it through legalistic eyes, then it is true that formally this breaches the law. If you see it through democratic eyes, you realise that, that international law should never be used in a way to stomp on national sovereignty and national lawmaking. Yeah, and there's a really interesting part where you said um, international law is being treated like God's law, something mere mortals don't understand. But you said a brilliant point. Britain is not breaking the law, it's making the law. If anybody out there hasn't seen that speech, it's on Claire Fox's website. Go and have a look. Now, just want to wrap up, Claire. I've asked all of today's guests for their predictions on the direction of travel on Brexit. Marks out of 10, with 10 being that joyous, clean break you and I campaigned for as MEPs and have dreamed of since June 2016. Zero being a complete capitulation. What's the scores on the doors, Baroness Fox? 
I think five to six. I think that Boris Johnson, with or without Dominic Cummings, knows that if it is seen that he is to betray Brexit, then he really is finished. COVID has thrown things into the air. A lot of people who voted for him are already upset about lockdown measures. But the one thing they hold on to is that he will deliver some kind of a reasonable Brexit. He's under pressure to do that. It won't be the clean Brexit we want, but it could be a sufficiently good enough break from the EU that we're happy. He's still got a chance, which is why this programme and all of those people who are watching must keep up the pressure. He's not just doing this on his own. And if he thinks that the public will, the red wall voters and everyone else will be furious with him, we know he's a populist, we know he's an opportunist, and we know he doesn't like upsetting too many people. So let's remind him how upset we'll be. I mean, there she is. A lot of people uh, were surprised when she was um, put into the House of Lords, but isn't she doing her job? She's like a wrecking ball to that place, Belinda. Oh, I'm so proud of her. And she speaks for so many of us. And the, the, the really important point, I think Claire highlights, which many of us feel that for many politicians, diplomats, former politicians, there comes a point in their career where they start to, their ego starts to sort of uh, be more um, supported by international applause, the national applause. There's a sort of a, a disconnect where, you know, a, a, a drinks do at a foreign office party with their international friends approving of them becomes far more important than, than reflecting, representing the people mm, of their own country. Yeah. And this is what happens with MEPs. It's what happens with the House of Lords. They're, they just become disconnected from the, the nation they're supposed to be representing. Yeah. And uh, before I go to our fishermen's friends, June Mummery and Paul Lyons, again, we've got some beautiful messages coming in and I think this one just sums it up and I think everybody watching this will agree um, this is from Adj McDonald thank goodness that Claire Fox is in the Lords I think we can all drink to that yeah. because she's making their lives uncomfortable she's putting it up and, and Belinda that's her job isn't she wonderful now let's move on June Mummery's been waiting very very patiently in the wings June we've seen a lot of different scores on the doors Today, we started off negatively from Ben the Beep. We expect Ben to be like that. We and then we moved on to, to, to Sir John Redwood, who gave it a 10. We expected him to be like that. And then we had Claire Fox on a five. So, so far, both extremes and in the middle. June, there's a lot to react to in this show and what's happened today. How are you feeling about Brexit? And, this, and especially, you are the beating heart of our coastal communities. You've got the ear of the fishing communities. How are they feeling? about the progress and the direction of travel on Brexit, June? Well, I'm, I'm torn at the moment because I listen to Ben and then I'm feeling down in the dumps. Then I listen to John and Claire and then, you know, at the end of the day, Boris has had a tough week. Not only is Dominic Cummings, his best buddy, leaving him, I'm hearing he's being henpecked by Carrie. And what I don't want to see is the Meghan Harry thing happening again. You know, they always say behind a successful man is a woman. Well, let's just listen to this. Let's hope that Carrie, you know, this lovely girl who swans about and she thinks this is right, then let's hope that she does the right thing and push her man in the right position, which is to lead the EU, take back full control of our waters and the resource. It's as simple as that, Martin. You know, at the end of the day, if he betrays coastal communities and discriminate citizens that have every right to have a beautiful life like everybody else, then quite frankly, like Claire said, he will be finished. Absolutely amazing. And do you know what? We, we, because we're on Zoom, we're not allowed to laugh out loud because it would cut to us, but bloody hell, that was funny. Honestly, <laughs> it, was just, it was perfect because most people are thinking, hang on a minute, what on earth has Carrie got to do with any of this? Is she a Lady Macbeth or is she like an Evita who's going to come out on, and, and be all proud and, 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 and support the democratic will of the oh. people? Um, so, you know, well put, June. Um, I think that's fantastic. But I, I wanted to ask, you know, earlier this week, um, it emerged that uh, Barney had offered £90 million in exchange for access to British waters. Um, he based that on 15% of the yeah. total catches, that was right, by European boats. What do you think of that? That's an insult. An absolute insult. Now, we should leave because of that damn insult. 
That is absolutely appalling. I mean, he said some really, really nasty things and some pathetic statements, but that has to be the most pathetic statement I've heard reference fishing. Now, at the end of the day, how any prime minister can sit there and take that insult is beyond me. You know, Boris really, there is, he's got serious problems. He needs to now surround himself with people like Sir John and other Brexiteers and get some friends on his side. Because if I was sitting there and listening to that insult to my country, I would not have it. 90 million, it's, once we've taken back control and the figures that we have as part of the group that I work with is 6.6 .6 billion pounds. And he talks about 90 million. Is it, he, he, he's taken the mickey now. He's making us look like a damn laughing stock in this world. And that is so wrong. At the end of the day, that's not hard to see that when someone is taking the pee. And to me, that was a really, really bad insult. And that was quite upsetting to read, actually. And then we find Mr. Barnier walking out in the mist along the whole, or with the level playing field. You know, he, he's not going to score any more goals as far as I'm concerned. Boris needs to grow a pair. He needs to sort his government out. You know what, Dominic leave and we'll let Dominic go. You know, why should any prime minister be, be worried about anything like that? At the end of the day, he, he's got to start leading. And if he's having problems in that department, then go and ask someone like Sir John, who knows the way we should be leading and, 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 and pushing things forward. Yeah, you know, June, every time I speak with you, I say the same thing. And that is, you know, we need to get you to be an elected representative again, because they wouldn't know what to make of you in Westminster, just the same as they didn't in Brussels. You're a disruptor. You're an ordinary person. You speak from the heart. It doesn't go through a filter. That's yeah. why we love you to bits. That's why you're the queen of the fishermen. Before I ask you for your scores on the doors on Brexit, I want to cut to Paul Lines. Paul Lines, you're above, you're, above, you're on your boat there. Are you in Great Yarmouth? Yeah, I'm in Great Yarmouth, yeah, and might I just add, where I'm standing, we've got a Nelson's column here, Norfolk's greatest son, but when I hear John Redwood, there's one thing that I can say, he's English's greatest son, but we need to clone him and get 60, 625 like him and sat in that parliament to run this country, because I'm sure that would run a damn sight more efficient and better for everyone and what it is at the moment. Well, there we go. The, an <laughs> the answer to our problems is human cloning. <laughs> Paul, I'm afraid for now that's beyond our grasp, even of the best scientists in Britain. Look, two big points I want to put to you, Paul, and I hope you are. Was that a hip flask you were drinking from there, by the way? And if not, why not? No, it's Diet Coke, I'm afraid. Oh, you've let us down. It's not it's Nelson's rum from the barrel on his ship with his <laughs> skull in, I think it was. <laughs> I was expecting a bit of Navy rum on board there, Paul. Anyway, look, two points. First of all, Ben Habib, who's still on the line, he said in an article in the Express this week, he thinks that Barnier will get what he wants. And he believes that Boris will give away quotas to France and Holland on a tapered down three year basis. How would that go down in the coastal communities? Well, that's just an abject failure, that is. That won't go down at all, because the thing of it is, he ain't got any quota to give them because they nearly got it all anyhow. That that mean to say that with the one boat left in Great Yarmouth and the ten left in Lowestoft will go down to none, because they have got the vast majority of quotas that are available in the North Sea in the Channel now, so you you, you can't give them any more. And and I I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I I, I believe that you can't give away sovereign waters. Unclos give us that waters back. And the London Convention will give us the six to 12 mile back. Unclos take account of the rest. Now, there's an awful lot of scaremongering going out there. And I have a positive view on Brexit, like John Redwood do. And I, I think that it's it would be unforgivable to do any deals on fishing at this stage because the government will just be throwing themselves to the wolves. They, I don't honestly think they're stupid enough to do that. I really don't. I give them more credible than doing that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, two, two things, Paul. Um, one, have you seen any preparations that the government might have been making along 
on the coast to prepare the coastal communities for this incredible new fishing freedom we're about to have. And number two, after 40 years of EU membership, how many boats are left, fishing boats are left in Great Yarmouth? Well, there's one fishing boat left in Great Yarmouth. I'm, I'm on a new vessel that my son is preparing, ready to go to work. I'm going to retire and work on my little boat, and he's working on this big boat. But the government have had four years to prepare for us leaving, and they've done nothing. They, they, they haven't got enough personnel. They haven't got enough officers. And, and, and they actually will be asking for extensions to do this because they aren't prepared for us leaving Europe. And that's just crazy situation. But we see it every day. Me and June have been to meetings and June always asks us, well, what preparation work have you done? And they do not want to answer that question. They do not want to answer that question. What are they prepared to do? Because basically it's nothing. OK, well, before we move on to our final guest, June Slater, I want to ask our two fishermen friends for your scores on the doors. Ten being a beautiful clean break, zero being capitulation. First of all, June Mummery, how are you feeling about the scores on the doors? Martin, it's a difficult one. Um, five, actually. I think that um, Boris will probably watch this. I'm sure Carrie will get him to tune in and to what, have a little look at this. And after watching this, you know, five, you know, I put on a, a, on a, a, a bet for um, Donald to win. And I'm, I think I've lost that. So I don't know, actually I, I'd say five, um, I, you know, 50, 50. Okay, I mean, it's 50, ridiculous. 50. Yeah. All right, Jean, thank you very much for that. Um, and Paul, what are your scores on the doors? How, how close to a clean Brexit do you think we are now? Well, I'm going to go for a 6.5. <laughs> okay, that's positive. That's this well, hopeful. Well, John, listening to John Redwood, well, that would lift anyone's spirit. Yeah. What a great man he is. Well, I've always admired John Redwood. Yeah, and to imagine that he's faced the the, the muscle of Remain for four years and he's still got all that energy. He, he's been a fantastic guest, just like both of you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much to our fishermen's friends there. Now, look, the scores are getting averaged out. They're getting balanced out by the positivity from the coastal community. I know maybe that's a reluctant positivity from June. And June, I, I feel your pain. I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm right back down in the middle ground. And I think that's being optimistic. But I need we need to stay optimistic otherwise um we we become as depressing and depressed as ben habib no offense i <laughs> I, I, I i love him to bits and i can see him laughing away in the yeah. background there that's your <laughs> come back in the conversation if you want ben but we need ben's <laughs> wisdom as well because without that sort of side i think he gives a good balance so so thank you ben it may be a bit eeyore sometimes but we need that to keep us grounded <laughs> <laughs> okay now then um, so a new little slot we're going to have on Unlocked, Brexit Unlocked. If you haven't heard of June Slater, where have you been? June Slater, she calls herself Queen Gammon. Um, she certainly is a provocative voice. But I tell you what, June Slater's inbox is the beating heart of the grassroots of Brexit. Forget about the House of Lords, forget about the House of Commons, and definitely forget about Brussels and Strasbourg. If you want to know what people are really thinking about Brexit, then you speak to June Slater. I spoke to June Slater earlier on today and she recorded a short monologue, okay, rant about the mood on the ground. Over to June Slater. My message box this morning is awash with anger and disappointment from Brexiteers right across the board. Hundreds of messages all along the same lines. Who's running number 10 is the first one. When did I vote for Prime Minister Carrie? That's what's being said in messages. We're absolutely sick to death of it because we've been fighting for this for four years and now it looks like we're going to get dragged down the road of an extended transition, a quite even possibly a wishy-washy agreement that is Brexit in name only, the very famous Brino. Boris needs to get his act together. That's what people are saying. We've trusted him and we've voted for him for one of these key issues, which is Brexit. The Tory government only came to power with David Cameron because he promised the referendum and he promised to walk us through it. Do you remember all that? He'll be there to guide us through it. And what did he do? He jacked on the day and he didn't even name a successor. And it's protocol to usually name a successor and he didn't. He left it fallow. Then there was a shuffling about and we got Theresa May. 
who was useless and had to step down. And then we got the king of Vote Leave, the man we had all the faith in, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was then the prime minister of this country, who came out with his famous, he'll die in a ditch. And then he had to die in another ditch. And now he's digging another bloody ditch. We're sick of them. We're sick of the ditches. Then we've got people that he's appointed, like Lee Kane. I've had bread last longer than him, and he's supposedly what? Because of a rift with him and Carrie. Carrie, who isn't even the Prime Minister's wife at this stage. And then we've got Dominic Cummings, a keen Brexiteer from the Vote Leave camp, also leaving because of rifts in number 10 involving Carrie, according to the press. So the Brexiteers want to know who's running the country. They don't remember voting for Prime Minister Carrie. That's what's being said. We are so angry about the way it's being handled. And the Tory party need to remember they got an 80 seat majority because the country was scared of Jeremy Corbyn, not because they thought you were that marvellous. Not because they thought the Tories were any good. You'd already cooked your goose with the public, with shoveling us with Theresa May. You'd already, you're already on a downward slope and stupid manifesto ideas. So when we got Boris, we thought, home run, at least we can get Brexit. And even Remain is to say, well, let's just get on with it. And now where are we? We're sat here at the 11th hour wondering if, one, transition is going to be extended and rebadged, or two, a wishy-washy deal where Boris will get slapped on the back by the EU because it's what they want, because it might as well just be in. It's Brian or Brexit in name only, something we did not vote for. We're sat here as Brexiteers, 17.4 million people still fighting for democracy and what they voted for four years ago. And now we have to wonder just how much influence and politics is going on in number 10. There is something wholeheartedly wrong about this lot. What can you say about a June that we haven't said before? June Slater is about as subtle as a brick in a leopard print skull. We need it. We absolutely need it. And, you know, big message to Boris and the Parliament Conservative Parliamentary Party. You didn't get to power because of Biden and Harris or because of the EU. You got to power because the ordinary Brits on the street trusted you and trusted your manifesto. And to be quite honest, Martin, they've got a very high bar to, to, to live up to. But live up to it, you must, or you will be finished at the next election. Keir Starmer is he's drooling. He's drooling that you will, you will break your Brexit manifesto pro promises. So please don't do it. And it's interesting how June Slater also concurred with June Mummery <laughs> and the general public picking up on the facts who's actually wearing the trousers yes. in 10 Downing Street and that thing about Harry and Meghan I thought was absolutely epic. <laughs> I'm going to be laughing about that after the show as I raise a drink. Sadly we can't do it in a pub because they're still locked down but we're going to have a little drink after the yeah. show. I hope you will do the same at home. Now thank you so much for tuning in today to Brexit Unlocked. If you like what you see, please share with your friends, follow us on social media at Facebook. It's at Unlocked United Kingdom on Twitter. Send in your comments, stay involved, keep the faith. But the main thing is we must keep up the pressure. There's only 48 days to go. It's been too long a journey, Belinda, for us to stop now. Yeah, absolutely. Keep the pressure up. People power. You know they go wayward, these politicians, unless the people keep the pressure up. So thank you for joining us. Very and much. one final point. Um, June Slater has just texted in and she gave me her scores on the doors. And just like you, Paul Lines, she was saying she was feeling very low before John Redwood. She was a three before John. She rose to a five. So the Redwood effect has been lifting the troops. I guess that's his job so quickly. Ben Habib, one out of 10. John Redwood, 10 out of 10. Claire Fox, five out of 10. June Mummery, five out of 10. Paul Lyons, 6.5 out of 10. June Slater, five out of 10. What's your score, Belinda? Well, all the deadlines have been missed, so I don't think he's serious about a no deal. I think it's five out of 10. Five out of 10. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go four. I'm sorry to end on a negative point, but Ben Habib is waving in the background there. He's going to buy me a drink. I have to do what he says. He's the boss. Listen, everyone, thanks for tuning in. It's been a brilliant episode. Thanks for watching Unlocked. We love making these shows. We're the new kids on the block. Please follow us. Share with your friends. We're not going to stop until we get the job done. Thanks for tuning in. We've been Unlocked. Thank you and good night. Good night.